Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our series on presidential assassination attempts. In the first part in the series, we looked at presidential assassination attempts against FDR. There were a few near misses, including one case where a bullet was only two feet away from his head. If FDR had been assassinated, you can pretty well argue that World War II would have turned out very differently. In fact, the alternative history, Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle, is about how Nazi Germany wins World War II and controls Europe and, by extension, the United States, And the place where his timeline diverges from our timeline is where FDR is assassinated successfully in 1936. Now, that's not to say that the Nazis would have won World War II. And in one of my podcast episodes, I look at the man in the high castle and I argue that there was almost no scenario where Nazi Germany could have won. And you can go back to the archives and listen to that there. So I'm not saying that Nazis would have won if FDR would have been shot. But who knows how differently history could have turned out. In the episode previous to this one, we looked at JFK, the attempts against his life, and why he, among all presidents in the 20th century, was successfully assassinated when others weren't. And at least from the Secret Service detail we have reports from, it sounded like it was simply a perfect storm of everything going wrong. If one of 50 things had not turned out the way it did, he wouldn't have been killed. But he was away from his Secret Service detail. They couldn't keep up with him. Lee Harvey Oswald was particularly lucky and a host of other factors. In this episode, we're going to look at presidential assassination attempts against Ronald Reagan. Some presidents are a little bit easier to protect if by personality they're more reserved, like Jimmy Carter. He was likable enough to his Secret Service detail. They got along well with him and they enjoyed his company. But he was reserved. He didn't mix in crowds quite as much. And because of that, he was easier to protect. But with Reagan, it was a little bit trickier. There's a quote from his Treasury Secretary, Donald Reagan, and he said, Here you have a delicate balance between protection and politics. Reagan is a politician. He likes to be with people. He was elected by people. Now, to prevent that man from getting close to people is wrong. So we're going to have to balance that off. Well, it was a tricky balance. He was successfully shot. He was not killed, but he was difficult to protect. And we're going to look at how the nature of assassination attempts against Reagan, what they look like, and if they fundamentally changed from earlier presidents. Was the ideological stripe of would-be assassins different in the time of Reagan than the time of JFK or FDR? Was it similar? Was it still just people who might be mentally ill and trying to seek fame and notoriety in the fastest way possible? Well, let's jump right in. So Ronald Reagan, America's 40th president, he arguably hastened the end of the Cold War. He led a conservative revolution that revitalized the Republican Party that had been pretty weak since the New Deal days. His second term was trickier. His administration suffered scandals in his second term, especially the Iran-Contra affair in which Reagan subordinates sold arms to Iran as ransom for hostages and diverted profits from the sales to rebels fighting the Marxist Sandinistas, then governing Nicaragua. What became known as Irangate invited comparisons to Watergate, and it undermined Reagan's credibility and weakened his powers of persuasion with Congress. But despite the affair, Reagan achieved a nuclear arms agreement with the Soviet Union that reduced the arsenals of both the Soviet Union and the United States. So, very consequential president. And this set the stage for a new relationship with the Soviets under the leadership of Mikhail Gorbachev. When Reagan left office, many historians credited him as one of America's greatest presidents, or at least in the top ten, due to a host of factors such as economic leadership, ability to get along with political opponents, moral leadership, and other things that if you look at the C-SPAN listing of greatest presidents in which historians give their input, you can see the criteria more fully, but Reagan tends to come up pretty high in this list. So the White House Secret Service detail made no secret of the fact that they were pleased 
when Reagan defeated Jimmy Carter in the 1980 presidential election. Reagan's agents found the new president charming, affable, and down-to-earth. Reagan said he loved the Secret Service ever since an agent told him in 1976 that they did not use the crouch position when firing their pistols because, they said, when you are firing, we're standing between you and the assassin. He often joked with them, remembered their names and the names of their spouses, and always had a kind word and appreciation for the difficult jobs they had. They were also delighted that Reagan treated them as equals, something that Carter had difficulty doing. Former agent Joseph Petro said, Reagan was always telling stories and always happy to see the people around him laugh. The graciousness that Reagan's always showed the agents was return in kind. He referred to us as the fellas. Agent Patrick Sullivan said Reagan was just a sincere gentleman. Air Force One flight engineer James Bazelli said, Reagan never got on or off Air Force One without sticking his head in the cockpit, saying, thanks, fellas, or have a nice day. He was just as personable in person as he came across to the public. Other agents drew sharp distinctions between the personalities of Reagan and his wife, Nancy. Reagan was such a down-to-earth individual and easy to talk to, one agent said. He was a great communicator. He wanted to be on friendly terms. He accepted people for what they were. But his wife was just the opposite. She saw that he was having a conversation with the agents, and it looked like they were good old boys and he was laughing. She would call him away and remind him. She called the shots. Former agent William J. Bell said, Nancy was not liked by many of us. Reagan also respected the professionalism of his protective detail. He didn't challenge the advice his agents gave him about what was best for his protection. Although Reagan didn't like wearing the protective but uncomfortable four-pound Kevlar bulletproof vest, there were times his agents insisted upon it and he complied. Reagan faced the greatest threat to his life shortly after his inauguration. In November 1980, after abandoning his plans to shoot President Carter, John W. Hinckley stalked the president-elect. Although Hinckley had stalked Carter and had been arrested on weapons charges at an airport the president visited, he was not on the Secret Service's watch list as he'd never made an overt threat. But had the airport authorities searched Hinckley's suitcase, they would have discovered his diary, which detailed his plans to kill Carter. In February 1980, Hinckley changed his target once more, but only momentarily. He decided he wanted to be the third Kennedy assassin and kill Senator Edward M. Kennedy, the last of the Kennedy brothers. He arrived in Washington, D.C. and visited Kennedy's Senate office. He waited in the corridor for the senator to appear. Frustrated when Kennedy didn't walk by, Hinckley made his way to the Capitol, thinking he could attack the senator there. But he backed off when he saw the metal detector at the entrance to the building. Instead, he headed for the White House, and joined a tour of the executive mansion. On March 29, 1981, Hinckley checked into the Park Century Hotel on 18th Street, two blocks west of the White House, and directly across the street from Secret Service headquarters. His luggage contained two 22 caliber pistols and a 38 of the type used by John Lennon's killer, Mark Chapman, the previous December. The next day, Hinckley wrote a five-page letter to actress Jodie Foster. Dear Jody, there is a definite possibility that I will be killed in my attempt to get Reagan, he wrote. This letter is being written an hour before I leave for the Hotel Hilton. Jody, I'm asking you to please look into your heart and at least give me the chance with this historical deed to gain your respect and love. I love you forever. Shortly afterward, he left for the Washington Hilton. He left a newspaper cutting about President Reagan's schedule on his bed. The schedule disclosed that President Reagan would leave the White House at 1.45 p.m. to address a session of the AFL-CIO's Building and Construction Trades Department at the Washington Hilton Hotel. Hinckley shot Reagan as the president left the Hilton. The chambers of his pistol contained six Devastator bullets designed to explode on impact. He shot twice, paused, and fired off four more rounds, all within two seconds. Agent Dennis McCarthy said he heard a pop no louder than a firecracker. It was a moment he'd been training for, but dreaded. McCarthy knew he had, in his words, 
to get to that gun as Hinckley continued firing. After the third shot, McCarthy saw the gun protruding between television cameras about eight feet away. He dove for the gun and landed on Hinckley's back just as the sixth shot was fired. The assassin offered no resistance and dropped the gun to the ground. As McCarthy pulled him to his feet, he saw two hands grab Hinckley's throat and it entered his mind that his role had now changed. He was no longer protecting the president, but his would-be assassin. Press Secretary James Brady, Secret Service Agent Timothy McCarthy, and Washington, D.C. police officer Thomas Delahanty were also shot and seriously wounded. As he heard the sound of shots, Secret Service Agent Jerry Parr shoved Reagan into his limousine, and then, after noticing the president had been wounded, directed the car to the George Washington University Hospital. The president had been hit under his left arm by a bullet that ricocheted off his limousine. It had missed his heart by a mere inch. Although not believed to be serious at the time, Reagan's wounds were in fact life-threatening. Parr observed years later, There's a couple of times where truth and training converge, where history and destiny converge. I thought about that for a long time. At that moment, either you do it or you don't, either you save him or you don't. Reagan underwent surgery to remove the bullet and repair a collapsed lung. Dennis McCarthy blamed himself for, he said, not acting fast enough after Hinckley began shooting. I began to think I might have acted like a coward outside the Hilton, McCarthy said. He and fellow agents reviewed the television footage of the shooting, and as colleagues pointed out, McCarthy had reacted as fast as humanly possible. Nevertheless, McCarthy became depressed about his role in the shooting. An internal Treasury Department review of the circumstances surrounding the attack generally praised the agents on scene, but it was less than praising about the intelligence work of both the Secret Service and the FBI in identifying threats in advance. It said, The Secret Service's protective capabilities have been impaired by the decline in the quantity and quality of intelligence collected by the FBI. The report attributed the decline to restrictions placed by the Justice Department on the intelligence information the FBI was permitted to collect and share with the Secret Service. The review concluded that the Secret Service needed to make use of advances in statistical methods and data processing to improve its analytic abilities. The Treasury Department also criticized the poor communications among Secret Service agents during the assassination attempt. The Secret Service's failure to have a hospital security plan and Reagan's medical records handy, and a lapse of duty of several agents who stated the crime scene instead of accompanying the president to the hospital. During Hinckley's trial, prosecutors learned more about his pathologies. The assassination attempt resembled the scene in Hinckley's favorite movie, the Martin Scorsese movie Taxi Driver, in which Robert De Niro tells a woman that if she rejected him, he would carry out an assassination. De Niro then goes to a political rally in New York City, carrying three guns, but doesn't get close enough to the presidential candidate to shoot him. The FBI also discovered that Hinckley had become fascinated with previous assassinations or assassination attempts. Following his arrest, Hinckley emulated Robert F. Kennedy's kill her, Sirhan Sirhan, by telling police he knew nothing about the assassination attempt. He also emulated Sirhan by asking the arresting officers if his act had been broadcast by the media. Police officers said Hinckley was excited about appearing on television. In 1982, a District of Columbia jury found Hinckley not guilty by reason of insanity. Juries had accepted the judgments of Hinckley psychiatrists that the would-be assassin had been suffering from psychosis, delusion, and depression when he shot Reagan. Hinckley was committed to St. Elizabeth's Hospital for treatment of his mental illness. The verdict provoked an outcry. Two years after the assassination attempt, President Ronald Reagan wanted to meet his would-be assassin. In 1983, Reagan asked the White House physician, Daniel Ruge, to see whether a meeting with Hinckley would be possible. Reagan wanted to know what Hinckley's caregivers thought. Roger Peel, who was then head of psychiatry at St. Elizabeth's, who oversaw but was not directly involved in Hinckley's treatment, told Reagan that it wouldn't be wise for him to meet with Hinckley. I was concerned that it would diminish Mr. Hinckley's sense of responsibility, he said. I didn't want him to feel rewarded in any way for what he did. 
In 2009, 28 years after the shooting, a judge allowed Hinckley 